Well, welcome to the March 22nd, 2020 edition of Bible Teaching and Preaching from the Shoto Baptist Church. And if you're able, I want to invite you to join with me in your copy of God's Word to the book of Acts, chapter 17, where I'll be reading from there in just a few minutes. You know, last Sunday, uh, right here, or near here, uh, I preached a message addressing the developing issue of the COVID-19 virus and its impact on life around us at that time. The title of the message was Disorder, Order. And the two days prior to that, we had had a terrible blizzard and snow drifts all over the place and still very windy and a lot of people couldn't get out. Uh, We almost couldn't get out of uh, our home. And I think a lot of us were wondering, are we going to be able to meet for worship even last Sunday? Uh, But we did. Those that could were able to come, and we had a great time together. But I don't think any of us at the time were thinking, uh, you know, next Sunday we probably won't meet uh, because of the impact and the uh, influence of decisions to help minimize the spread of this virus. But here we are, and uh, not meeting together in the flesh, but certainly in the spirit And I pray that you will approach it that way, a time of worship, a time of hearing from God's Word, uh, but also a time to capitalize on personal disciplines of prayer, uh, Bible study, and reading, uh, reading and sharing on your own between you and the Lord. You know, everybody has their opinions and their input on what to do, what not to do, but we decided earlier this week that uh, we would not meet today and next Sunday together corporately but rather I would share a message like this, uh, again, in a voluntary effort to try to minimize the spread and risk of spread of this virus during a very critical time. So uh, here, here we are, or at least here I am, and there you are. <laughs> Some people said, Pastor, you're going to preach a, a virtual sermon? So if you're thinking, oh, look, it's a virtual sermon, uh, I want to tell you this is not a virtual sermon. This is a, this is a real sermon. Uh, It's a real message. I'm really here. I'm really going to be preaching. So this is not a a virtual sermon. In fact, it it takes more preparation for me in a sermon in these circumstances than otherwise. It's not a virtual sermon. But I'm going to treat you, uh, on the other hand, as a virtual congregation. uh, Because because virtually you're not here uh, in the flesh. But I'm going to pretend like you are. So I'll need to pretend like you're smiling or grinning or... Uh, whispering an amen, uh, or whatever it is that you might do if we were here meeting together during this time. So let me share with you, there have been two important initiatives on my heart and on my mind now for nearly a year. Uh, I've talked about both of these with people and sometimes leader groups, sometimes with individuals, but one of them has been to develop an online network of Christians as well as other people in the Rocky Mountain Front area, our communities, our regions here in Montana, uh, people who are interested in learning more about the gospel and about um, what Scripture teaches us about Jesus Christ and people that might be interested in teaming up for uh, action and ministries, initiatives from time to time uh, and as the opportunities might arise. This is a ministry that would have its own identity that's bigger and broader than the identity of Shoto Baptist Church, but it by no means would be meant to replace this church or any other church, just simply to broaden our opportunity to strengthen believers, even believers that worship at other churches. We might have a chance to help strengthen them, but more importantly, uh, to be able to help new people uh, come to Christ and learn what the Bible teaches about knowing God. So that was one thing. The second thing I've uh, dealt with in my mind and heart is to have a sermon series that uh, helps the average Christian more easily answer the question of what do I believe and why? What do I believe and why? For some people it's easy to answer that question, or at least you think it is, especially if you've not been asked that question. Uh, But for most people, there's an honest desire to be able to answer that more during times of doubt or wondering in their own heart, or when people might ask them questions. Uh, So I believe that interpreting really what's going on in our lives right now i believe that now's the time to launch both of these things and so that's what's taking place 
Uh, in fact, I'd like to use the same name for this ministry that I mentioned that goes beyond our identity here at Shoto Baptist Church. Uh, the same name for that uh, as the name for this sermon series. And that name is Hope of the Rockies. Hope of the Rockies. Now, that name is inspired by one of our, our, our primary missions partner ministry uh, that was born in the heart of a young lady that was discipled in her family and in this church, uh, Heather Lytle. And the name of that ministry is Hope of Africa. It's also inspired by a sister church of ours in uh, Red Lodge, Montana, Church of the Rockies. So Hope of the Rockies, I just pray, will be a term that can help us uh, in this series, but also in an outreach ministry that's bigger than our church, but a part of what God wants to do in our region. Uh, When it comes to this Hope of the Rockies outreach ministry, we've already launched a Facebook page and we request for you, if you use Facebook, to go onto that page and and click like. But not only do we ask you to click like on that page, but we want you to think about this when you have friends uh, or neighbors uh, or or even enemies, (laughs) amen, for sure, even enemies uh, who might be interested in... uh, um, being directly involved or even overhearing, so to speak, some Bible studies, invite them to go to the page and like the page as well, and we will see what God does for that in the future. At, in one way, I think it will help us as a church in, internally in our church family to take our life groups ministry even to the next level with this organization, uh, especially when things get back to normal and we can physically meet in homes or wherever. But more importantly, I think it'll give us a chance to uh, take the gospel and organize some Bible studies and prayer groups out in the community with uh, a a large percentage of the people who are not even professing believers or not affiliated with an existing church. So it's really exciting to be a part of that. Uh, You may need to be called on to take certain roles in that, so pray about it as well. So that's already begun uh, to help us better mobilize and make disciples for Jesus Christ. Christ. So with that said, then we go to the second initiative, and that's to launch this sermon series by the same title, Hope of the Rockies. But the title is Hope of the Rockies, Know What You Believe and Why. All of this is to help us grow in our faith and be able to communicate it and to be able to strengthen not only ourselves, but to strengthen others. So part of the focus of this series is what's called apologetics. Some of you know the term, some may not. Apologetics typically refers to some teaching and training, some information, some evidences that help us to be able to, uh, perhaps from an academic standpoint at least, answer the question about why do we believe what we believe? Why is it, if we say that the Bible is our source of authority, why do we say that? And, And on what grounds should we expect someone else to do the same thing? So helping give some evidences of truth, evidence of the resurrection of Christ, Evidence that what Scripture says is indeed true and reliable and without error uh, as God's inspired and God-breathed Word. So that's what apologetics is. Uh, And we will have some apologetics in this series, but the entire series is not about apologetics. And when we get to apologetics, for some people it's going to feel a little bit deep, uh, maybe for a short time. Uh, But for some other people, it's going to feel very shallow. And so understand that we will and we should always offer more small groups, conversations, Bible studies, where people can go deeper because there are always going to be more to say. But when I'm preaching in this series and I'm preparing, I'm trying to preach to uh, the average Christian, their average inquirer who needs to have a starting point, a place to spring forward with uh, on what they stand when it comes to their foundation. And And so understand that uh, this won't be as deep as some of you possibly would like for it to be. But we want you to be able to be secure in what you believe when it's challenged. Or or if you believe wrongly, then we want that to be challenged. Uh, You might hear some things and be exposed to some things that challenge what you believe. And you say, maybe, maybe I was wrong. So um, today I want to introduce the sermon series with a, a brief message the sermon series, Hope of the Rockies, What You Believe and Why. But I want to introduce it by talking about why it's important to ask those questions and why it's important that you be able to work towards answering those questions. So 
uh, I'd like to make a case today for this quest, the quest for you to answer those questions. I'd like to make a case for the quest, and that's the title of today's message. Now, in Acts chapter 17, before we read out of chapter 17, understand that Paul uh, was on one of his missionary journeys, and while he was there in Greece, he was waiting on other disciples, other missionaries that he was going to team up with. And while he was there, he saw that um, the society, the lifestyle of Greece back then, people would get together and constantly discuss new things, new beliefs. And really all they're interested in is if you had something new. And so they would end up, end up if there was a belief, they would add that to their other beliefs. And they would have idols and statues to every god you can think of. Every god that they knew of. There was some representation for him there in Athens and in much of Greece. And so while Paul looks around at all these, quote, gods and the uh, monuments to them, he notices one that really stands out. Let's read then in Acts chapter 17, verse 22. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens... I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. This is what it said. To the unknown God. To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Verse 24. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, He does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and he has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings. Verse 27, uh, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, and though he is not far from each one of us. And then skip down to verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. By the man, capital M, referring to Jesus the Christ. By the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Uh, What a dramatic story as Paul comes to give them the news of who their unknown God is. I believe that the people of Athens had an awareness, an inner sensing of God, but the details of truth and the specifics about God eluded them. And so they knew something was missing and they even erected a monument to the unknown God, the one they didn't fully know, the one they didn't understand all the details about. And I think the people of Athens then represent all of mankind, men and women throughout the ages, that we also sense the same thing and have a desire to know our Creator. There's just too much evidence of His existence and the questions that we have. And I think even now the multitudes around the world are sensing the existence of God and hungering to know Him in a personal way. Uh, But there's only a fraction of those people who believe something know why they believe what they believe. And it makes for a terrible, terribly shaky foundation whenever challenged, whenever questioned, or when things come their way, it leaves them, or even believers, those that say they're Christians, it leaves them without any confidence to be able to share their faith and help other people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so that's why it's important that the case for you to be on this quest and for me me to be on this quest is that if we admit it, we really don't often have very secure foundation of why we believe what we believe. And often the population of the world, a majority of it, it really doesn't seem to be that urgent to them until something bad happens, until there's disorder in their life, there's disruption in their life, there's a trauma or tragedy or even great fear that comes about. And so again, it it, uh, results in a very weak foundation when danger comes and those foundations can crumble It was just a few months ago that we preached from Matthew 7 when Jesus talked about the men with two different foundations, seemingly the same lives, the same houses, but different foundations. And one man built all the good things he had on a sandy foundation, 
And when the rains came and the floods arose, it washed away the foundation and all of his house fell. And the Bible says, and great was its fall. And Jesus contrasts that with a man who built the same house, perhaps, and had the same life, perhaps, but he built it on a different foundation, a foundation of rock and stone. And so that when the floods came, the foundation held and the house stood and that man continued to be able to go because of his foundation. And it's not hard to give an application that Jesus says that this represents our lives. We spend our times, our thoughts, our, our efforts to build our lives, but we don't stop and secure our foundation. So you and I don't want to be out here saying this is what I believe and, and uh, yet not really understand what we believe and why we believe it. He wants you to have that foundation. So this series... Um, at times it will turn to apologetics, but mostly the desire is for the average Christian to be able to, again, to have that, that starting point, that foundation to be able to understand and even communicate the basics of what they believe and why. Uh, this series is not meant to program you for the rest of your life or everything that you need to know and answer all of everybody's questions, but again, a place for you to start and something you can stand on. Think about it this way for a moment. If someone says, why do you believe what you believe? Uh, you might, in all honesty, and a lot of people would say this as their number one answer. Why do you believe what you believe? Well, my father believed this. My grandfather believed this. It's my heritage. A heritage is important and uh, a very powerful thing, isn't it? And that may be enough for you as to why you believe what you believe. But how does that help someone else that had a different heritage? How does that help you uh, lead someone to faith in Christ whom their heritage is different? Their father and their grandfather were Muslim clerics. Or perhaps they were um, uh, followers of a cult leader. Or whatever it might be. So it's not enough for you and I, or it should not be enough that you say it's because it's what I was taught. So when it comes to this quest for what you believe and why, uh, it's important that you really seek this and get the answers. So I would like you also to consider your motives. Not just because I'm asking you to do this and not just because, well, it's the series the pastor's leading right now, but what would be your motives to want to know the answers to the question of why, what you believe and why? Uh, is, is it just because uh, you're constantly being bombarded with questions and non-believers and you feel like you need to, to, to be able to answer them to get them off your back? Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You want to be able to do that. You want to get your own relief if you feel pressure and threatened. You should be able to answer questions. Uh, but is your motive just to get people off your back? Is your motive just to feel better about yourself, uh, believing and following something, a teaching or someone that the rest of the world doesn't necessarily follow and believe? Is it that you really would like to be able to win all the debates? You, you don't want to be... Uh, embarrassed and you want to be able to answer a question better than someone who is trying to debate you is that your motive for wanting to spend time in apologetics well i think that our motives are important because what happens uh, here as a result of your study and your quest for these answers really may depend on what your motives are um, apologetics is not meant to be a technique to win people or win debates Rather, it's supposed to be a reminder of our willingness to work with God to help people discover His glory and turn to His glory. So those are the motives of why you should want to answer these questions. There are things we should want to know and want to learn, uh, evidences of, of science and history and things that we will look, about it, look at in at least two, series, two sermons, that is, in this series, and that is why the Bible is believable. And why should we believe the Bible? We'll get to that. Uh, and these are things we should want to know. But I don't want you to think that this is just going to set you up and fix you up to go out and look at the world and say, uh-huh, uh-huh, I got something for you. I've got something to keep you quiet because that's not really what's happening here. People uh, are not saved by grace through information. People are saved by grace through faith. And you can never educate a person enough to the point where they say, okay, now I'm a genuine Christian. I'm a genuine believer simply because you have answered all of my questions. There is sufficient evidence for that. 
But the heart is not made that way, and God does not bring a heart to belief that way. God will use evidence. God will use answers. God will use uh, academics or whatever it might be, information. But mostly he uses revelation. And I repeat again, uh, when Peter was asked by Jesus, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're blessed because flesh and blood, man didn't convince you of this, but my father in heaven has convinced you of that. So no matter how you and I may equip ourselves and get educated on why we should believe Scripture and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't think that that's what's going to save people because God is going to use that to bear witness to people, bring them close to a point of belief, but He will never bring a person past the threshold that requires faith without them exercising faith. That means that they don't have all the answers. They don't believe it because it's just obvious and they can't help but believe it. It means that God has said it. He has made witness or brought witness in their heart that is true, invited them to believe, and they say, God, if you'll enable me to believe, I believe and I'll follow you. And that's faith. And without that step, then uh, a person never can truly be saved. So don't think that your education is going to win people more than uh, the Holy Spirit persuading them and you being a part of bearing witness to them that the gospel indeed is true. So I think of this illustration. I hope that it comes across properly. Imagine for a moment here what's at stake. Not only your own security, your only confidence and strength in what you believe, but the case for this quest of those answers has perhaps other people's uh, eternity at stake. And I imagine uh, this analogy, perhaps we can think of it this way, that uh, all of us lived life uh, on the shore of an ocean. And on the shore of that ocean, everybody begins, but, uh, and you find comfort, you learn to live there, and you like it there. But you look out to the waters, you've never been in the waters, but you see some people in the waters. And you see them eventually try to swim, and eventually they struggle, and eventually some of them just fall beneath the waters, and you don't see them again. Or then you see this boat out in the water and, and uh, someone comes near the shore and, and they uh, try to share with you and others. They tell you about the waters and they tell you about one day that you'll be in those waters and uh, one day you're not going to be able to swim but so long on your own. And, and then they begin to tell them about the boat. They begin to tell them uh, what the boat's there for and what the boat does. And somewhere along the way, that person looks at the boat and, and they're not sure that they really trust the boat because they don't understand everything about the boat. <laughs> and they look at the water and they, uh, you know, they really can't see how that boat stays on top of the water. I'm not sure I trust that boat. I'm afraid of that water and I'm not, I don't know about this. And so that person explains to them a little bit about how the boat works and perhaps the uh, materials in the boat and the design of the boat and then uh, buoyancy of water and gives a great scientific explanation of how that boat stays afloat and that person listens a little bit and goes on and says well that's interesting but still they're not ready to get into the boat and um, time goes by and they're going along and like everyone sooner or later life has a way of developing a wall behind everyone on the shore and often when they're not expecting it, certainly not wanting it, it sort of just gets closer and closer and just shoves them into the waters. <laughs> and uh, imagine that person like anyone else. Now they're suddenly in those waters. And now they look around and they can't get back to the shore. Uh, they don't really know what to do. They swim for a while and perhaps they don't even panic yet. And they just get used to the water, trying to figure out what they're going to do. Just treading water, thinking if I can just get back to that shore, if I can just get through this water. And uh, they see other people around them in, in the same situation. But they, just like everyone else, can't swim forever. And they can't get out. And then there comes the boat again. And the boat comes along and comes back to them and, and invites them. This time the boat is uh, uh, letting them know that you don't have to stay in that water. That this boat is here. And guess what? I've gotten into this boat and, and I've found safety from the water. And it's wonderful. You know, not only would I never want to get back into that water, but I would never even want to get back on that shore if I could. And so the person hears that and sees that. You tell me. At this point, you and I represented uh, 
if believers in the world today as those in the boat. And if we were to look to those people and say, guess what? Hey, how are you doing? I see you in the water there. I'd like to come, and I want you to know everything about this boat. I want to explain to you the details of the boat. You've probably had questions before, but I assure you, here's the design of the boat. Here are the uh, properties of the elements of water. Uh, here's the buoyancy, all the things we talked about. Now, do you trust this boat will keep you afloat? Would you like to get in? At this point, I would suspect that the most effective thing for them is not that you finally persuaded them that the boat is good enough, but the most effective thing is this, that number one, you're able to say to them personally, this boat, this boat has been my salvation to get out of the dangerous waters that I was in just like you. And this boat has been my answer. And I can tell you I would never want to go back. And then the second thing you're able to do is you're able to invite them into the boat, help them into the boat, tell them how to get into that boat. And those are the most effective things you can do. It's not that they're going to get in the boat just because you convince them of the properties and the science of the boat or the physics of the boat, but rather that they have a need. They realize that need. They've heard from you. They see the opportunity, and they want to get in that boat. And, uh, you know, some people that say they're Christians and churches come along, and I would say in this analogy, they might be in the boat riding along people in the water and wave at them, and their objective is just to be nice at them. Their objective is to come along and throw a little floating food into the water around them, give them a, a, a more comfortable wetsuit while they're here in the water, and just come back and check on them tomorrow. And I think that that's the fallacy of uh, Christians in many churches. That's why it's so important that we be uh, what many would call an evangelical church, that we see that even though we want to give them comfort, we want to show love, we want to help them, but our commission, our call, our priority before anything else is to do all those things for the purpose of helping them get out of their situation, out of the dangerous waters, into that boat, representing the salvation that comes through knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, even in Genesis, the, the ark represented God's salvation as the only salvation, and the door of the ark representing Jesus Christ as the only way into that salvation. And so you and I, as much as we should want to learn more and know more and be able to win debates more, I want to ask you, would you pray uh, along with me that God help our hearts that the motives for why we want to be able to answer what we believe and why is for the purpose of helping to not only be secure in ourselves in our own heart during times of doubt, but to be able to help, help other people not only hear why they should believe, but all that much more be motivated and ready to help them to believe and be saved through Jesus Christ. Well, um, this is what's at stake. And the message of Scripture, the message of Jesus Christ, is absolutely a message of hope. It's not just a message of damnation and judgment because of the terrible waters and why you got into those waters and how bad you are for being into those waters and falling into this mess. Rather, that's only the introduction of a message of hope, uh, of why we need hope, a message of salvation through Jesus Christ. And whether it's you and me individually or any church anywhere, if our message is not one of hope and an invitation to people to believe and helping them know how to believe so that God can help them and God can change their life, rather than us just trying to go around doing good deeds just to make them feel better, uh, God wants to lead them to faith and belief first so that He can miraculously and amazingly provide for all of their needs. Apologetics is not about mastering and memorizing techniques, said uh, Alistair McGrath. He said, rather, it's about being mastered by Jesus Christ and the truth found in Scripture. So we know what it's like, don't we, to sense that something's missing or someone's missing. But do you know and do your neighbors and your family, do they know what it's like to hear a messenger from God show up and say, I'm sure that you know that there is an unknown God, and maybe you have questions about Him, but now God has sent His messenger, His message, His truth to you to tell you who He is. He knows that you have not known for all these other times, but our ignorance is no longer an excuse, he says. Now, through the man, through Jesus Christ, 
God, fully God, fully man, through him, salvation has come. And he answers the question of who the unknown God is. Do you know what it's like to get that message from God? Do you know what that's like to hear it from Scripture and to see it in the lives of others? Do you know what it's like to sense that in your heart? And then on top of everything else, a God that knows you, a God from whom you have no secrets, a God who has been patient with you, created you, do you know what it's like then for him to prod you on the inside? And I don't mean just some vague emotion, but I mean something that you know is different than emotion. It's a void. It's a hunger. It's a move. Personal for you. From the one who created you, he took the time, he took the care to invite you personally to respond and believe to what he's told you through Scripture and all those who bear the message of Scripture, to trust Jesus Christ who was crucified for us, buried and raised again on the third day as a substitute paying for our sins and our judgments. Jesus Christ, do you trust Him for your salvation? It's a wonderful case that we have to go on the quest, to answer the questions what we believe and why. Pray as next week we plan to come and give a simple summary throughout Scripture, brief but concise, lot of scripture how it fits together and how it centers around this message of how we can know the unknown god i pray that you would have your heart open to him you don't have to have me to pray or someone else to pray near you and with you that's what the bible teaches otherwise the bible teaches that you pray you can pray directly to god find someone if you have questions me someone else they'll pray with you but what you need to do is read god's word and uh, just pray honestly to him and say, God, I want you to finish what you're starting in me. I want to know you. I don't want to know you again as the unknown God. I want to know you as my creator and my savior. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, be faithful in following you. And um, God, help us hear from your word. Prepare us for other messages and a series and for the reasons why we want to be able to know why we believe what we believe. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray with confidence in him and in your faithfulness to us, we pray, amen.